This module is designed to provide tips for improving infection prevention activities to avoid healthcare associated infections. The module includes information on developing workplace culture, environment of care assessment, and policy considerations. References have been included at the end as this is not a comprehensive review of all infection control practices. Healthcare administrators must recognize that only real improvements result in sustainable change. Sustainability happens when a new practice loses its separate identity and becomes part of regular activities. Desired health benefits are improved and the improvements are maintained over time. And staff maintains building capacity, that is, they share expertise and provide ongoing support to others. Workplace culture can have a major impact on infection prevention sustainability. A workplace culture of safety can be enhanced through recognition that patient care is a team effort and many viewpoints are sought to prevent harm. As an administrator, it is important to acknowledge that wise decisions are made when there is diverse and independent input. Create an environment where teamwork is embra embraced and frontline workers speak up if they have concerns and are heard when they express their concerns. This empowers staff to identify and learn from mistakes without fear of reprisal. Measure safety culture by assessing attitudes held within the facility from leaders to frontline staff. This includes how open healthcare personnel are to discussing safety concerns, how safe they feel speaking up, and how well they believe that they work as a team. When assessing staff attitudes, use a standardized validated tool, for example, a hospital survey on patient safety culture. Safe work principles must be adopted by every member of the team. Basic principles of safe design include standardized work, creating independent checks for key processes, that is, checklists, and learning from mistakes. Safe design principles apply to technical work, for example, clinical practice improvements, and adaptive work, such as teamwork and cultural change. To improve safe practices for the prevention of healthcare-associated infections, focus on improving systems rather than blaming people. Create clear healthcare-associated infection prevention goals that include working on sustainability through culture change. Discuss the role of all staff and patient safety at staff meetings. Physician buy-in and participation is critical, and all disciplines working in the facility must be included. Nurses, physicians, and support staff. Engage staff to identify defects, that is, a clinical event or operational situation that you would not want to happen again, or any incident that someone believes caused harm or put a patient at risk for harm. This can be done by asking staff to identify likely ways patients may be harmed in the facility. Partner with senior executives who can hold staff accountable for reducing patient risk and perform safety rounds monthly. Continue to learn from defects by asking four questions. What happened? Why did it happen? What you can do to reduce risk? How will you know risks have been reduced? And implement tools for improvement. Maintaining a high quality of environment of care involves many departments and disciplines, such as administration, environmental services, human resources, and materials management. These departments can collaborate to contribute to infection prevention by ensuring proper maintenance of medical equipment as well as appropriate use of cleaners and disinfectants. Department administrators should ensure that there is an appropriate area to reprocess equipment that is an area separate from clinical care areas for cleaning, packaging, sterilization, and storage of sterile supplies. Make routine rounds to perform visual inspection and provide feedback to frontline staff and ensure staff know and follow contact times for products. These contact times can be found on labels and in manufacturer guidelines. Policy development is an important part of maintaining the environment of care. Policies for cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization should include all surfaces and equipment that can reasonably be expected to be contaminated by bacteria, such as high-touch surfaces. Clarify what needs to be cleaned, but not necessarily disinfected. 
Define responsibility and frequency for cleaning and disinfecting patient care equipment and surfaces. Describe how cleaned and disinfected items should be labeled, for example, date and time. Staff should be able to answer the question, how do you know whether this item has been cleaned and or disinfected? And designate how policy compliance will be monitored. Administrators should tour all areas at least annually and clinical areas twice per year to monitor environmental cleaning processes. During these regularly scheduled tours, administrators should look for the use of only federal environmental protection agency approved disinfectants. This includes identifying that disinfectants are readily available where equipment disinfection is being performed and identify that disinfectants are used per manufacturer's directions, such as for contact time and dilution. Make sure standard and transmission-based precautions are followed as appropriate. Confirm regularly, regular cleaning and dusting of high and low surfaces and ensure that environmental service carts are kept clean and are locked when unattended. The easiest and single most important factor in the prevention of pathogen transmission is good hand hygiene. There are a number of barriers to hand hygiene. Both individual and system factors contribute to poor adherence with hand hygiene. Individual factors that negatively impact hand hygiene compliance include Irritation and dryness caused by hand washing agents, such as soap and alcohol-based hand rubs. And staff perception of hand hygiene issues. For example, believing there is a low risk of acquiring infection from patients or disagreement with hand washing requirements. System factors that negatively impact hand hygiene compliance include facility design issues, such as lack of sinks or sinks that are inconveniently located and facility supply issues, for example, a, lap, a lack of soap and paper towels. Additionally, not having consequences for not performing hand hygiene contributes to poor adherence. To maximize infection prevention and minimize the impact of barriers to hand hygiene adherence, administrators should consider the following factors when selecting hand hygiene products. Efficacy of antiseptic agent, acceptance of product by healthcare personnel. Since dryness or irritation of hands is often cited as a reason for noncompliance with hand hygiene regimens, consider providing hand healthcare workers with hand lotions or creams that do not interfere with the effectiveness of antiseptic agents. And accessibility of product. Be sure to have an adequate number of hand hygiene areas stocked with soap or antimicrobial soap paper towels, and trash cans. Alcohol-based hand rub dispensers should be placed at or near appropriate room entrances and in patient rooms in compliance with fire codes. Seek assistance from facilities engineering or the safety officer. Administrators can help improve hand hygiene adherence by making hand hygiene a facility priority through encouraging patients and families to remind healthcare workers of hand hygiene, monitoring adherence to hand hygiene, keeping a record of adherence to hand hygiene. This can be done using secret shoppers or an iScrub app, checking the volume of alcohol-based hand rub used per 1,000 patient days, observing adherence to policies on wearing artificial nails, and by giving feedback providing feedback to healthcare workers individually by service department or unit. Comparisons to other units can create healthy competition. Besides monitoring cleaning, disinfection, sterilization, and hand hygiene practices in a facility, it is key to ensure that the care environment is set up to support safe injection, preparation, and administration. In addition to having an appropriate area to reprocess equipment, as mentioned earlier, it is important that all facilities have an area separate from clinical care areas for medication preparation. This space should be clean and designated for medication preparation only.
Sharps containers should be secured, user-friendly, and placed appropriately. Ensure that they are not too high nor directly under a glove box or electrical outlet. Sharps containers should be replaced regularly, changing when they are three quarters full. Policy considerations for injection preparation and administration include Needles, syringes, lancing devices, and medication administration tubing and connectors be required to be used for only one patient. Injections be required to be prepared using aseptic technique in a clean area free from contamination or contact with blood, body fluids, or contaminated equipment. Single dose medication vials, ampules, and bags or bottles of intravenous solution be required to be used for only one patient and multi-dose vials be kept in a centralized medication area and do not enter the immediate patient treatment area. In summary, create an environment where teamwork is embraced and everyone speaks up if they have concerns and listen when others speak up. To improve safe practices for the prevention of healthcare associated infections, standardize work, create independent checks, and learn from mistakes. To maintain a quality environment of care, tour the facility regularly to monitor environmental cleaning processes, and develop policies that clarify what needs to be cleaned and define responsibility and frequency for cleaning. Monitor adherence to policies and give feedback. Through teamwork, policy development, and adherence monitoring, healthcare facilities can reach the goal of reducing the risk for healthcare associated infections. For more information on Environmental Protection Agency approved disinfectants and fire codes, visit the following websites or click on the links in the description box below. We would like to thank the California Department of Public Health for use of their materials to develop the content for this webinar.